Dave Dutt Church. He's from Lincoln Christian University. Um, Sam knows him very well. We've uh, interacted with him at uh, different conferences, and I know some of the ladies met him here a while back at a conference. And so, Dave, you ready? I'm ready. Okay. Well, good morning. Good morning. Good morning. It is good to be back. I think I was here last May, and it's uh, good to be back with you today. And I, I just learned, I didn't realize, but uh, Lyndall Props grew up here, and uh, I'm going to be meeting with Lyndall and some of the leaders from his church this afternoon, and uh, just down the road, I guess. And that means Warren Props grew up here, and when I preached at Rochester, Warren was a member of our church. He's a good friend of mine. Uh, he is something. And so it's good to know who to blame for the way he grew up. You know, he, he was something, but he, he's a lot of fun anytime you're around him. And then if I remember right, a guy named Ed Nichols used to be here. And uh, Ed's son Mike and I roomed together for three years when I was at Lincoln. And I've been to Africa two or three times with Ed. And I was on the board of ACM uh, where he is a missionary. And so... Uh, there, I, I've got a lot of connections here at Weber Street that I didn't really know I had uh, some of those until today. I do bring you greetings from the campus of Lincoln Christian University and, and just again, good to be here uh, with you today. Now that, that's kind of my, my uh, official greeting. Now, now let me bring you two different possible greetings that I could share with you today, okay? Let, let's see if you can tell the difference between the two. Are you ready? Okay, here, here's what we, we've got to have some grand rules. If you are really responsive, it puts me in a good mood. If I'm in a good mood, I preach short sermons. If I'm in a bad mood, I go for a long time. So let me ask you again, are you ready? Oh, yeah. I thought maybe you were. Okay, here, here's one greeting. Well, good morning. It is so good to be with you today. I have been looking forward to this ever since Sam called me and asked me if I could be here today. Sam and I have been friends for about 23 years. We, we served on the same staff down in Kentucky together. I think the world of Sam Stowe. And so when he called me, I said, you bet, I will come. I can't think of any place I would rather be than right here with you. In fact, I, I get to speak somewhere almost every week. But after being here in May... You were one of my favorite congregations, and so it's just a thrill to be here with you today, and I hope that this will be a blessing to you. And yeah. is, is that a new shirt, John? No. Man, it, it just looks so good. You wear it well. Okay, that's one greeting. Here's another greeting. Hey. Well, i got to be honest with you. I'm not feeling too good today. Top that off, I had to get up, drive an hour and a half to get here, all because Sam Stowe called me and asked me to come. And i, I got to be honest with you, I never have liked that guy anyway. <laughs> I can think of a hundred places I'd rather be than right here, but nope, I'm here, you're here, at least try to stay awake, okay? Where did you get that shirt? <laughs> did you get dressed in the dark today? Yes. <laughs> Do you see any difference in those two greetings? Maybe, maybe just a little bit. What is the main difference, do you think? Attitude. Attitude. In fact, I want to submit to you that attitude is a difference in almost every area of life. It is a difference so often between a, a smile or a frown or a criticism or a compliment. And, and I believe that attitude so often is a difference between living like someone who belongs to Christ and living like someone who doesn't even appear to know Christ. Attitude makes all the difference in the world. Now, I read a story several years ago about a guy named Jimmy Moore. Jimmy Moore was 29 years old, but he was dying. His heart was bad. It was getting worse. There was nothing they could do. And then one of those acts of, of uh, modern medicine, he was able to receive a heart transplant at Vanderbilt University Hospital. Two years later, he competed in the Music City Triathlon. I don't know why anyone would ever want to compete in a triathlon. It, it blows my mind. But he swam a 1K swim, a 40K bike ride, a 10K run. That's over 32 miles. When he crossed the finish line, they said that there were two things that, that stood out as the people saw Jimmy Moore cross that finish line. One were the tears in his eyes coming down his face. The second was his T-shirt. 
He had a special t-shirt made for the day that said simply, I've had a change of heart. Isn't that great? I've had a change of heart. I read that story and I thought, wouldn't it be great if everyone who needed a heart transplant could receive one? What I think might even be better, though, is if everybody who needed a change of heart would receive one. If everyone who, who needed a mind transplant would receive one. And I, that's what I want to talk to you about today, having a new mind. If you have your Bibles, turn to Philippians chapter 2. Philippians chapter 2, this is one of my favorite passages in, in the Bible. Philippians is probably my favorite New Testament book, and chapter 2 is just a, a great chapter. And it talks about the attitude of Christ. I, I doubt today if we're going to cover anything brand new. But as we start this new year, as we start and, and get used to writing 2015 and all those blanks, I get used to that in about October, and then it'll be time to change. But I, I thought it might be good for us to consider attitude as we enter this new year. The Apostle Paul begins, Is there any encouragement from belonging to Christ? Any comfort from His love? Any fellowship together in the Spirit? Are your hearts tender and compassionate? Then make me truly happy by agreeing wholeheartedly with each other, loving one another, and working together with one mind and purpose. Don't be selfish. Don't try to impress others. Be humble. Thinking of others is better than yourselves. Don't look out only for your own interests, but take an interest in others too. We'll, we'll stop right there for now. The Apostle Paul is writing this letter to the church in Philippi, and you can tell when you read this letter that he loved the church in Philippi. They loved him. They, they had a great relationship. And he basically says in, in this letter, here's how you can make me happy. Let, let's just pause right there. Let me ask you a question. This could be the most important question of 2015 so far. How many of you watch Duck Dynasty? <laughs> Not many. How many? It's okay. I watch it. Any, anyone? I love Duck Dynasty. I, I DVR it. And uh, watch it sometimes. I'm gone quite a bit. So sometimes I can watch three or four episodes in a row. I, I like Duck Dynasty. And, and, you know, Duck Dynasty, the, the Robertson clan, they're, they're all committed Christians. And, and they're, uh, they're taking advantage of the limelight that they're on, the spotlight. And they're doing a lot of things for Christ. I predict one day there will be a Duck Dynasty study Bible. I really do. And, and, and here's what I think will happen. In this Philippians 2 passage, I think the, the Duck Dynasty paraphrase will be, and here is how you can make me happy, happy, happy. <laughs> That's what Phil says. He says, hey, Paul says, here's how you can make me happy. And, and then he says, agree with each other. <coughs> Love each other. Work together. Don't be selfish. Don't try to impress each other. Not really rocket science, is it? And yet it's hard to do. But let, let's think about it. He says, agree with each other. We don't always agree with each other, do we? And I'm not talking about out in the world. I'm talking about in the church. I get called on a regular basis to meet with churches that are in conflict. And most of the time, they're not in conflict over big things. I, I don't know if I've ever been called to a church to sit down and talk to them because they are so upset because they're not reaching their community for Christ. But they're not agreeing with what songs they ought to sing or whether there ought to be pews or chairs or whether the minister ought to wear a tie or not. And there's so many things that, that we disagree on that divide us. Paul says agree with each other. He says you need to love each other. And, and again, we're not always loving to each other. And I'm not talking about in the world. I'm talking about in the church. I, I've been in ministry for 37 years. And in those 37 years, I've had the privilege of spending time every Sunday morning with some of the most loving, gracious, generous people on the face of the earth. Every Sunday, I've got to be able to spend time with those people. But can I be real honest with you? Some of the meanest people I've ever met in my life would never dream of missing church on Sunday morning. Do you know what I mean? Just nod. Don't point fingers. Just nod. Okay? I, I, I don't know why, but I think Paul knew that. He said, you're pointing fingers. I'm seeing you. <laughs> Paul says, love each other. And then he goes on. He says, don't be selfish. How easy is that? 
Don't be selfish. I'd love to be able to stand here before you today and tell you that there is not a selfish bone in my body. But somewhere in this book it says that we're not supposed to lie. <laughs> and I, I've got to be honest with you, if, if we do things the way I like to do things, how I like to do things, when I like to do things, if I get everything my way, I'm the happiest camper in the world. But if you change any one of those, I can start getting a little bothered. Paul says, don't be selfish. <laughs> so what do we do? What do we do? If, if Paul says, here's what I want you to do, love each other, work together, don't be selfish, and we have a hard time with all those things, then what's the answer? Well, look at verse 5. He goes on, he says, you must have the same attitude that Christ Jesus had. Well, that clears it up, doesn't it? That's just short, sweet, hard to beat. Have the same attitude of Christ. That's easy as ABC, isn't it? Well, it's easy as ABC as far as knowing what we're supposed to have, but how many of you think having the same attitude of Christ is that simple? It's not simple, but it's who we've been called to be. It's how we've been called to think. It's how we've been called to treat each other. And so what I want us to do with the time that we have left is look at what I'm calling the ABCs of an attitude adjustment. And I, I just hope and pray that, that some of these things that we talk about today will be helpful as we start this new year. <coughs> the A is aim for selflessness. Aim for selflessness. Now, I started bow hunting a few years ago, and before I, I went out in the timber, I decided I better be able to hit something that I aim at. And so I, I went out and I did a lot of target practice, and, and, and a target looks something like this. It's got, it's in the yellow, it's called a bullseye. And here's what I learned about shooting a, an arrow at this target. If I aim for the bullseye, I didn't always hit the bullseye. But if I aim for the bullseye, sometimes I, I, I most time I'd be on the target someplace. But my aim was at the bullseye. Now, if I wanted to say, hey, I'm really good, see this line right here on the edge? I'll bet I can hit that. You know how many times I hit that? I wouldn't hit it. I'd, I'd be way off here. I'd usually be off the target. If I aim for the bullseye, I would at least be on the target. If I aim for the edge of the target, I'd always be off the target. Are you following me? Are you wondering what on earth does that have to do with having the attitude of Christ? Well, it's simply this. We need to aim for selflessness. And, and this bullseye is Jesus. That, this bullseye is being selfless like Jesus. And if we aim for this bullseye, if we say, I want to be like Jesus, I want to be totally selfless like Jesus, if we don't hit the bullseye, at least we're on the target, and we end up being a little less selfish. But what a lot of us do is we want to be as close to that edge as we can. And if we try to aim for the edge and then we miss it, we end up being selfish. Now, I think there's a whole lot we can do with this target. I, I think that as far as following Christ, a lot of us want to be right here on the edge. A lot of us want to have one foot in the kingdom and one foot in the world. It doesn't work that way. And if we want to be selfless, we need to aim for selflessness. We need to aim for being as much like Jesus as we possibly can. The Apostle Paul goes on and he talks about Jesus and he says, though he was God, he did not think of equality with God as something to cling to. You think about that. He, he, he gave up everything. He was God in heaven. He had it made. And he gave up everything to come to earth. He gave up everything and he suffered and he died for us so that we could spend eternity in heaven with him someday. He gave up the luxury of heaven to be born in a stable. For at least three years, he didn't even have a home. You think of all the things that he let go of. He let go of angels worshiping him to have men shout at him and ridicule him and spit on him. He gave up being the creator to... He wanted the created. He didn't hold on to anything. He gave it all up. He did not think of equality with God as something to cling to, or the NIV says something to grasp. We need to aim for selflessness. And here's the question I want to ask you before we move on. As we enter this new year, is there anything that you are holding on to? Is there anything that you are clinging to that is keeping you from being like Jesus? 
Is there anything in your life that you're holding on to that you need to let go of so that you can be who Jesus wants you to be? If so, then I, I want to submit to you that today is the day to let go. Today is the day to say, I'm not going to hold on to that. I'm not going to hold on to anything that keeps me from being like Jesus. We need to aim for selflessness. The, the B is become a servant. B is for become a servant. Jesus set the example of being a servant. And we need to follow that example. I served as the, the mission organization that Ed Nichols is a part of, ACM, now ACM International. I, I served on that board for 25 years. I was the president of the board for about 16 of those years. And it, it gave me an opportunity to do a lot of traveling. I, I've been to Africa 12 or 13 times. I've been to Cambodia and Thailand. A few, in 2008, I was able to go to Afghanistan. And I, I've just had some great, great opportunities. But I've been able to go to parts of Africa that are just impoverished, um, just the, the hunger, the sickness, the, the poverty is hard to imagine. And, and I want to take the mask off here a little bit. I, I want to be really honest with you. I have been given, for some reason, I have, I have been given the uh, prestige or, or used as an example of a servant leader who's willing to go to some of these places where poverty and sickness and, and all that exists. And, and I, I've been referred to as this unselfish leader. But I want to tell you what it's really like when I go to those places. I, I go to places where poverty is at a level that we have a hard time comprehending, where people have very little to eat, and I am treated like a king. I'm treated like royalty. And in fact, there are some villages, and, and you'll go to a different village in different countries in Africa, but the, the customs are the same, the traditions are the same. They take care of their guests. And, and I, I go to this village where I just wonder, how are they making it? I mean, they, they don't have anything to eat. And, and I'm meeting with church leaders, and all of a sudden I hear some racket outside, and I know what's coming. It's mealtime, and they're going to feed us. And the door opens and they bring in these plates and, and I know what's going to be on the plates. It's what I call the standard B&B. &B. It stands for beans and bugali. Now you know what beans are, but do you know what bugali is? Bugali comes from the root of the cassava plant and they, they dry it and they pound it and I'm not sure what all they do to it. And then they mix it with something and I'm not sure what they mix it with. But here's how I would describe it. If you took two parts cream of wheat and one part Elmer's glue and you mix them together and you let it set up, that's Bugali. It has no nutritional value whatsoever. No vitamins, no nutrients, but it's filling. And when you're hungry, you want to be filled. And I'll look in, and on the plate in front of me, there's beans and Bugali and maybe some rice all around the table and on every plate except for my plate. In my plate, there's rice and there's either chicken or goat. And I'm the only one in the room that has meat. I go to those places and I'm treated like royalty. Can I take the mask off just a little bit farther? Can I be a little bit more honest with you? I like it. I could get used to it. But that isn't the attitude of Christ. That is not what being a servant is all about. You see, the amazing thing is, we like to be honored. That's our nature. We like to be honored, and yet the one who deserves the honor humbled himself, and he came to earth. We go on, we read in Philippians 2, 7 and 8. Instead, he gave up his divine privileges. He took the humble position of a slave. He was born as a human being. When he appeared in human form, he humbled himself in obedience to God and died a criminal's death on a cross. There's a word I want to focus on. It's that word humble. We read it twice. That Jesus took the humble position of a slave and he humbled himself in obedience to God. Now here, here's what I've learned about humility. Humility is a tricky thing, isn't it? You, know, you, you, you think you're getting there and when you think you're getting better at humility, you've lost it. It's almost like, oh, I'm pretty proud of being so humble. I'm probably the most humble person in this room. You, know, you just kind of lose it. It, you remember that old country song, Oh Lord, it's hard to be humble? 
when you're perfect in every way, I can't wait to look in the mirror because I get better looking each day. Well, that's what we need to let go of. And here's what I've learned about humility. The world has a way of humbling you. Life has a way of humbling you. You know what I mean? Several years ago, I was, I was uh, on staff at a, a week of camp, a high school week of camp. And partway through the week, probably on about Thursday, this high school kid came up to me and he said, you know, I've been thinking all week who you remind me of and I finally have it. I said, who's that? He said, you look like a movie star. And I said, really? He said, yeah, you look just like a movie star. I, I should have left it alone right there. Okay, I should have just walked away feeling good about myself, but I didn't. I said, oh, who do you think I look like? And he said, Arnold Schwarzenegger. <laughs> I kind of thought, you know, he must think I'm pretty cut. You know, he sees these guns, you know. He, I said, do you really think so? And he said, yeah, Arnold has a big gap in his teeth too. <laughs> Life has a way of humbling you. Several years ago, I was preaching in Rochester, and, and, and it came to the end of the service. We had invitation time, and we had a little room off the side. That was our prayer room. And a couple had come forward, and, and they wanted me to pray with them. And so I went back, and I prayed with them. I come out and we're singing the last song and then everyone's going to be leaving. I was sitting in the back and I kind of worked the back of the room and talked to people, gave hugs and shook hands. And I, I'm in a pretty good mood. I, I'm feeling good. It's been a good day. I'm walking along the side and, and I, I've got my Bible like this and my Bible hit my leg and dropped on the floor. I, I, I bent over to pick it up. And when I bent over and picked it up, I heard this terrible ripping sound coming from behind me. I thought, uh-oh. This doesn't sound good. I went to the very back of the church and my wife happened to be walking by and I said, Cindy, come here. I think I ripped my pants. Can you go see how bad it is? She walked behind me and if you could measure laughter on the Richter scale, I knew it was bad. It, it was from the zipper to the belt loop. I mean, it, it was all, all gone. And instead of working around the room and shaking people's hands and hugging them, I'm back up against the wall. Just, hi, hi, have a good week, have a good week. But it didn't end there. Because as soon as church was over, I had to make a beeline over to the funeral home. I had to meet with the family to plan a funeral. You know, it's pretty hard to be dignified when you don't have a seat in the back of your pants. <laughs> I have learned that life has a way of humbling us. But here's what we need to see in this passage. It does not say that life humbled Jesus. It says that Jesus humbled himself. He volunteered to be humbled. And again, we like to be honored. But Jesus said, no, you need to be humbled. And I'll show you how. Our attitude need to, needs to be the same as that of Christ Jesus. Several years ago, I've got three adult kids. My daughter's 31, my son's 30, and my youngest son's 27. And uh, our youngest son wasn't born yet, but I think my oldest son is about two years old. My brother is preaching just south of here a little bit, Villa Grove. And we went over to Villa Grove for a revival one night, and our son Matt slept through the whole service. He was probably about two years old. We found out the reason he slept was he, he had the flu. And the way we found out he had the flu was when my wife woke him up after the service was over, he started throwing up. And he threw her up from the pew where we were all the way across the auditorium and down the hallway to the bathroom. It was a mess. And I'm standing there and a, a man came in a few minutes and he had this bucket of soapy water and he had a scrub brush and a towel. And when I saw him walk over, I said, hey, that, that was my son that made the mess. Let me clean it up. And he said, no, I, I got it. And I said, no, really, that, that was my son. He made the mess. I ought to clean it up. And he said, no, I, I got it. I didn't ask a third time. <laughs> I walked over and I was standing with my brother and I saw this man down on his hands and his knees with a scrub brush and a bucket and a towel cleaning up vomit from the carpet. And I tapped my brother and I said, Mark, is that your custodian? And he smiled and he said, no, that's one of our elders. And from that day on, Whatever church I was ministering at, when it came time to talk to people who were interested in being elders, and, and we were interviewing them and talking to them, and they would ask the question that everyone always asks, well, what does an elder do? 
I would tell that story. Isn't that what being an elder is all about? Really, isn't that what being a Christ follower is all about? In fact, on the night that Jesus had his last meal with his disciples before he was arrested and crucified, he took that pail and he took that towel and he washed their feet. And if you want to have the attitude of Christ, you need to become a servant. It starts with aiming for <laughs> selflessness. That, that if it isn't about me, it's about Jesus. You let go of whatever is holding you back. You, you focus on becoming a servant. And the third thing, the C, is for commit to sacrifice. Commit to sacrifice. Jesus' entire life on earth was a life of sacrifice. He gave up his place in heaven to become a man. He became a servant. But look at verse 8 again. It says, When he appeared in human form, he humbled himself in obedience to God and died a criminal's death on a cross. You know, Jesus taught us how to synchronize the way we think and the way we live. When we think of others and place them before ourselves, we become less selfish. When we begin to think like a servant, an amazing thing happens. We begin to look for ways to serve instead of waiting for people to come serve us. When we're willing to sacrifice something that is important to us, that's when we can begin to focus on something that is so much bigger than us. And Jesus gave up his life so that we can go to heaven one day. He made the ultimate sacrifice. And here's what I see Paul in, in, in Philippians 2. Here's what I see him at this point of the passage. I, I can just see him kind of wagging his finger at us and saying, and, and, and you, and you, and you, and you, go out and do the same thing. You need to sacrifice. Now, here's what I see in our society. We have lost sight of what it means to sacrifice. In fact, in, in, in the church, in the Christian world, in America, I think there are two concepts that we have just forgotten what they mean. One is persecution, and one is sacrifice. Persecution, this is a sermon for another day, so I won't get going too far on it. But it just bothers me so much when I hear Christians who start complaining and just getting so angry because someone at the mall wish them happy holidays with a smile. And they call that persecution. And I just wonder how Christians in Syria or Iraq or China would think when they think, oh, you're getting persecuted because someone said happy holidays? I think we've gotten kind of wimpy when it comes to persecution. But here, that, like I said, is a sermon for another day. But sacrifice... We have missed the boat. I don't think we have a clue anymore on what it means to sacrifice. <clears throat> For 34 years, I'd have people in my office, and, and, and we're talking about their lives. And I've had, I don't know how many people say things like, you know, my life, before I met Christ, I was pretty wild. In fact, I, I lived from one party to another party, and I lived a life of, uh, of drugs and, and heavy drinking, and I jumped from one relationship to another relationship, but I sacrificed all of that to follow Christ. And, and I would look at him and say, you did what? That's not sacrifice. Jesus saved you from all those things. All those things that cause suffering and pain and guilt and agony. He saved you from all of those things by His sacrifice. But listen to me. Following Christ calls for sacrifice. We need to sacrifice our thoughts to take on His thoughts. We sacrifice our time to serve Him and serve other people. We sacrifice our finances so that the kingdom of God can spread all over the world. We do need to commit to sacrifice. My guess is, and I, I don't, you know, I, I know names and faces a little bit, but I, I don't know you. I, I don't know where you are in your lives. I don't know your relationship with Christ. I don't know what you're struggling with. But here's my guess from working with people for 37 <laughs> years. There are some attitudes in this room that probably need to be adjusted this year. My guess is that there probably are very few attitudes in this room that don't need to be adjusted. 
this year. And it, it, it's not going to fix everything, but here's a good place to start. Aim for being selfless. Become a servant. Commit to sacrifice. And if we can do those three things in 2015, I believe it's going to be a good year. Let me wrap up by telling you a little story about my, uh, my brother. My oldest brother has a grandson named Andrew, and Andrew's biracial. He's lived with my brother and his family his whole life. He's 13 years old now, almost 14. He's a fine young man. When Andrew was about three, maybe four, he came home from preschool, and my brother's family was uh, in the living room. They, they were watching TV, and Andrew, out of, out of the blue, I mean, just he just sat up, and he looked at his family, and he said, I'm black. And they said, what? He said, I'm black. And I thought, where'd that come from? And I guess a little boy at preschool had informed him that he was black. Now, here's the wild thing. Here's what just got me when my brother told me that. Andrew brushed his teeth every day. He got dressed every day. He looked in the mirror every day. You would think it would have been obvious that he was black, but somehow he missed it. Somehow it went right over his head. So as I wrap up, here's what I want to do. I want to make sure that, that no one leaves this building missing something that you cannot afford to miss. I don't want to take anything for granted. You can come to a place like this week after week after week and still walk out and miss this. And I don't want anyone here to miss it. Are you ready? You belong to Jesus. You are a child of the King. You belong to the God of creation. God loved you so much that He sent His one and only Son to die on the cross to pay for your sins so that you could have eternal life in heaven someday. You belong to Jesus. So let's go out. Let's believe that. Let's claim that. And let's live like it. Let's pray. Father, I, I thank you for today. I thank you for your word and for the way your word tells us everything we need to know. And God, the world around us is just shouting at us all the time, telling us what we need to do and what we need to have and how we need to live. And most of those things are lies. Father, most of those things will just create a bigger hole in our hearts than we already have. Father, I pray that we would listen to your word. I pray that we would listen to what you have to say to us. And God, that, that hole that is in our heart, I, I pray that we would allow you to fill that heart, that hole with the things that, that come from you. God, it, it, it just seems natural in our society to be selfish, to think of ourselves, but that goes against everything your word teaches. In our culture, it's all about what people can do for us. But your word tells us it's really about what we can do for others. And God, again, in our culture, it's about what we can get. But your word tells us it's really about what we can give and what we can sacrifice. So, Father, I pray that as we enter this new year, that we would listen to you. That we would allow, allow your word to fill our heads and our hearts and our lives so that we can become more and more and more like Jesus every day. God, help us to pursue his attitude in our minds and our lives. Today, tomorrow, and every day. For it's in his name that we pray. Amen.